Welcome to a sleepy episode of Why Wait Till Sunday. I'm Alfred. And I'm Chris. It is Thursday, and this is Why Wait Till Sunday. Probably a top five midweek DFS show. Forgot to say that in the intro. Like I said, I'm a little tired. Chris is a little tired. We have been watching our Bravos win the world championship uh, over the past week or so. So that's nice. Congratulations, Chris. I follow the Braves. I live 10 minutes from the stadium, but I think this one meant more to you, maybe. Yeah, you know, I lived in Atlanta for the better part of a decade and and so became a big Braves fan. And so it was nice to, to see years of development come to fruition. So I, I was really excited. So I stayed up late watching the celebration and, you know, I've been up late for weeks now watching the, uh, the late night game. So love to see a you know, couple on the West team coast the team win. They played the Dodgers. So when they were on the West coast, those were kind of later games and, um yeah yeah i mean it, it's great I, a lot of my friends are really excited i grew up a marlins fan down in florida so i did get to witness two world championships there um much you know you can make a lot of fun of the marlins but they did win two na- two world series in my lifetime um and then i actually kind of transitioned to being a braves fan uh, i've been now lived in atlanta for oh like 13 years uh, met my wife here, have children here. We, we, you know, we live here. We're foreseeable future. We're going to be in Atlanta. So I've kind of adopted the Braves because I mean, I want my kids to grow up and be fans of the Braves if they choose to be baseball fans, which right now they're too young to really care, it seems. But, you know, be able to be not outcast at school rooting for the Marlins. I mean, I felt like that was just that was just mean. Um so I kind of transitioned to being a Braves fan, but obviously my fanhood is a little fickle if I do that sort of thing. So um, met, took a lot of heat from my friends down in South Florida. Um, <clears throat> so I'm happy, but I'm not like this. It wasn't like a life changing event for me. Like some, I think some of my friends, this was like a life changing event for them. So um, congratulations to the Braves. I have actually felt like a real sicko because I've been more interested in uh, Eastern Michigan and Toledo actually <laughs> than, than the Braves like last night. So <laughs> I, I feel like I'm just a psychopath because I, I just care about <laughs> college football. <laughs> but um, anyhow, Max and stuff to beat, you know, Max and stuff to beat. So Let's bring up the uh, the old slate here and let's get cooking. Uh, let's see. I need to do the share screen thing. Sorry, take a minute. But I did some, you know, we got the graphics back. We're, we're cooking with grease again. I know last couple of weeks it's been a little bit of uh, less uh, of a performance, you know, by me uh, on the show. But getting back in gear, we're going to finish strong. We're going to hit the last half of the season hard. Um, and we've got a pretty nice slate, Chris. You and I have been talking about how DraftKings has chosen some pretty crappy games to put on the slates. Um, but this uh, this week looks pretty good. A nice smattering of, of different teams. We've got some G5 matchups, which I think they should do more of. I think they should sprinkle in more, uh, you know, two to three to four G5 games in a, on a 13, 14 game slate. And so we've got some of those. I decided to put Bo Nix uh, as like the cover boy, basically, of our graphic here because I think he's earned it. And we'll talk about Bo Nix, I'm sure, a little bit. But I think he's finally earned it. The guy, I've made so much fun of Bo Nix for the past two or three years, like many people. But kid's playing pretty well. I, I made him our cover boy today in the big matchup versus Texas a and um, All right. So talk to me. Uh, you you have been banging the drum. I, I'm just going to give you the floor here because if you haven't followed the show all season, Chris Moxley was the one who identified that Missouri could not stop the run. And we have been playing running backs against Missouri all year. 
He has hypothesized that a tournament winning lineup will have two running backs from the same team against Missouri at some point this year. This could be it, buddy. So take it away. Missouri at UGA. What are your thoughts? So <laughs> this is a 39 point spread. I mean, when was the last time you saw a 39 point spread in an SEC game? Insane. Uh, I, I mean, that's just crazy. Missouri comes in uh, with an applied team total of 10.3 points. <sighs> I I just, this is a tough scene for Missouri this week. I think Georgia's going to run all over them, like I said. There is interest in the Georgia running backs and Georgia offense here, but Missouri is just totally off the board, I think, this week. Right, right, right. Um, total, I mean, you know, this is something you expected, like, bad – you know, bad Kentucky versus Alabama level. Like I didn't think Missouri would get this bad, but I guess pretty much any offense is rendered useless against UGA. And then if you don't even have a defense to kind of stop them, it's over. So, um, <clears throat> all right. Next on the list is a interesting one kind of encircled. I think on a lot of people who are in our, our space all year. And this is uh, Liberty headed to Ole Miss You've got the interesting story of uh, Malik Willis transferring from Auburn, going to Liberty, lighting the world on fire now, getting buzz as a first-round NFL draft pick. You've got Matt Corral, who some people think is the best quarterback in the country, and the numbers uh, seem to support it, uh, at least early on and, and last year certainly did. Um, you got two kind of cruddy defenses, although Liberty's defense is kind of good but you know their schedule uh, leaves a lot to be desired so will they get exposed um it's a massive 68.5 point total Ole Miss comes in at almost 40 implied points and Liberty sitting not too shabby at 29 two top half teams in terms of points scored there could be a lot of offense in this one and we will have to see if any of the prices match what we would want to do there Next on the list, another bonanza, Wake Forest at UNC. Uh, you can be a very casual college football fan and know this one's going to be explosive. Yeah, number eight, Wake Forest, I, I believe, heads That's to right. or it gets North Carolina this week. Um, this is a matchup in my neck of the woods. So I'm, I'm really excited for this game. The total here is 76, and it doesn't have the storylines of Ole Miss Liberty with Hugh Freeze going back and – seeing if he can prove himself. But this is a game that is all about offense. Last year we saw both teams score 50. Oh. I think we're going to see something probably similar this week. Wake Forest has been on fire there, undefeated heading into the season. North Carolina has been so-so uh, at 4-4. Four and four, But this is an offensive game. And the Tar Heels are favored, which means I think we're going to see a lot of back-and-forth points. Yeah, Tar Heels coming in favored. No one is respecting uh, Wake Forest. Most people think they are a mirage. Uh, I guess we will have to see this week. Um, G5 game, love this. SMU at Memphis. There's no real good reason for DraftKings to put this on here, but I love to see it. I'd much rather this than freaking putting Iowa on here again. Um, and so we've got, we've got the Mustangs going to Memphis and facing the Tigers. It is, as you would expect, a massive 70-point total. 5.5 uh, point spread means you're to looking at an implied score of 38 to 32 uh, with, Mem or with SMU coming out on top. You've got two probably top 25 offenses, two bottom half defenses. I mean, you know, this is a big one for DraftKings, for fantasy points, the whole nine yards. And from the ridiculous to from this, I don't know, ridiculous to the sublime, whatever. If you think defense is sublime, we've got Illinois at Minnesota. Yeah, this total is 44. Minnesota has actually been really impressive outside of their loss to Bowling Green. I, I know. I, like, I, what the hell happened? I, I don't know. And I, I tweeted earlier today. I said, when was the last time that a power five coach lost to Bowling Green and got an extension in the same year? I'm not sure it's ever happened. <laughs> PJ Fleck got a seven, I think yep. a seven year extension today. So con congratulations to him and the Gophers. I think that he's done a good job with that program, but um, yeah, this is low total. I mean, Minnesota's offense isn't exactly prolific. They're great against the run. They're great uh, running the ball. I mean, they've just been solid no matter who's back there. Um, Illinois had that big win 
against Penn State and lost to Rutgers the next week. So it, this total is probably appropriate at 44. Man, speaking of totals, as a sidebar, I – I tweeted out, actually uh, didn't end up getting it in. Uh, Unfortunately, didn't get it in before kickoff because my kids were being crazy. But uh, I wanted to go the under in Northern Illinois, Kent State, which got ballooned up to 72. And I felt real good after the first quarter that was seven to nothing. And now we are looking at about a... 38 and uh, Kent State is driving with a minute left. Could be a 45 point second quarter, which is a tough scene for the under. Um, so, just speaking of that, I'm keeping uh, tabs on that game. That's pretty wild. It's a 45 point quarter, not half quarter. That's oh insane. yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun game. Maction is the best. Ma- we do love Maction here. Um, okay, uh, Ohio State at Nebraska. This is an interesting game. I mean, I I like this game just from a, you know, morbidly curious Big Ten. I I love Ohio State. I think they're very, very good. But then we have um, Nebraska. I don't think anybody knows what to do with Nebraska. I've actually been listening to a couple college gambling podcasts this year to get a little bit of a different perspective because I think that can inform DFS decisions as well. And uh, there's a lot of people that don't know what to do in Nebraska. They're kind of just, you know, they can look so good and then they can just look absolutely atrocious. And it kind of rise and fall with Adrian Martinez. What will happen at home, their Super Bowl against Ohio State, because they may be flirting with not even being bowl eligible. So this could be game of the year for Nebraska. And uh, will they rise to the occasion? Texas A&M at Auburn looks like a probably a quality football game, but maybe not a lot of points. No, it's an under 50 total, which is not super sexy on the slate where we have a couple games over 70, but another good game, Nebraska, uh, Nebraska, Auburn's played better. Um, Texas A&M has also played better. I mean, Calzada is kind of in a rhythm, but they played bad teams. So I don't know how much you can really take away from that, but this should be just a good SEC matchup. I mean, enjoy it on your TV, but probably avoid it for DFS. Um, by the way, Kent State did get in. So that's a 45-point quarter. I'm not sure I've ever seen anything like it. Uh, Baylor at TCU. Man, a couple of years ago, I would have said this total should be like in the 30s, but not this year because Baylor's offense is pretty good. Their defense is decent. Uh, Texas Christian can't stop anybody, though. So this is pretty um, – I think Baylor's probably going to control this game. They're favored by seven. They have an implied total of 32, which could be uh, a place to find some value that not everyone is going to be looking for considering they have a 30-point team total. But I think people don't think of that offense as a whole lot of excitement. Uh, and then, you know, TCU uh, is just not the TCU of old and kind of crumbling. Uh, they're Gary Patterson's out. I don't I don't know. I'm not really interested in TCU right now. Oklahoma State at West Virginia. West Virginia has been cashing some dog tickets lately. They're on fire. Yeah, they've been good. Um, you know, I was I really thought that their secondary was going to be the key to their success on defense this year. But it turns out it's their front front seven. Like their front seven has been really, really solid. And and this is an interesting matchup because I don't love Oklahoma State's offense. I think that they leave a lot to be desired. And West Virginia, they showed up last week against Iowa State. So I don't really know what to think of this matchup. It is under 50, which makes me kind of avoid a lot of the plays in this game because there are some high-priced assets here that I I don't totally love. But – you know, this could be a sneaky, sneaky upside game. Just sneaky upside. Okay. Okay. I'm not I like saying it. I just, I, I think it's possible. I like it. Uh, next is Navy. You can't really see on the graphic here because I didn't really know. I didn't want to do gold because Notre Dame is gold. So I made it blue. Oh, I'm sorry. We're on Tulsa, Cincinnati. 
Woo, boy, struggling. Woo. Tulsa, Cincinnati, another G5 matchup. Not the most exciting game, although I DraftKings has pretty much, I think, made a commitment to putting Cincinnati on the on the schedule every single week, and they deserve it. They're a marquee team, uh, ranked very high. And uh, this is a 54-point total. Cincinnati favored by 22, which gives them a team total of 38. But we have not been playing a lot of Cincinnati other than Jerome Ford. I don't know if that changes this week. We'll have to talk about it. Cincinnati's defense is so good. You really don't want to play anyone against them from Tulsa. And Tulsa's offense is bad, too. Um, Notre Dame and Navy. A classic little game. Independent versus G5. We got a lot of uh, quirky teams on this one. I expect this game to play out exactly like Cincinnati Tulsa. To be honest, like I think we're going to get very similar game scripts. Notre Dame's going to limit Navy's offense. A Navy's offense has not really been anything to write home about over the last two years. Um, Notre Dame's been improving as much as they can. Um, so again, a forty-seven, a forty-seven game total is not super sexy. So yeah, it's not, it is it's what not. it is. Not what we want to see. This is this is a big slate about the haves and the have-nots in terms of team totals. Yeah. The DraftKings people love Big Ten, and so we've got to deal with Maryland and Penn State. 55-point total. Penn State, sneaky team total over 30, 30 points. They're at 33. That's ninth on the slate, actually. Um, against Maryland's defense, that is very bad uh, at, uh, or I guess for our purposes, good, but for their goals, bad uh, at allowing a lot of explosive plays in the passing game. Could be worth a look, and I do not think Nittany Lions are going to be popular, so that could be a place to look for some uh, low popular or not unpopular values. And then we've got Michigan State at Purdue. Not loving this one either. No, uh, this is our last game, right? But a 54 team total, it's not super high. It's kind of the middle of the pack. I mean, it's fine. Michigan State isn't the favorite that I thought they would be, which kind of creates a little bit of value on the Purdue side because I think that they're underpriced. So, I think we'll talk about them a little bit, but this game isn't super sexy compared to the team totals or game totals that are like 20 points higher. Right. And that does it for our uh, quick slate overview. Um, and now we go into the actual players. And so let's just go ahead and do that. Chris quarterbacks up first, as we always like to do. And, you know, Sam Hartman has become a, an absolute fantasy stud. He is the most expensive quarterback on the slate. He's coming in at 10,000. That is usually reserved for Caleb Williams, for Matt Corral. But hello, Sam freaking Hartman, 10K. What do you think? I don't want to say you can't play him because you absolutely can, but I'm not sure that his upside in this matchup is that much higher than guys who are like at least a thousand cheaper. And that's really the question that I'm trying to, to balance, right? He, he's just incredibly expensive in what I think will be a high scoring matchup, but there are other high scoring matchups on the slate. And so I think it's at least target some quarterbacks that are cheaper than him. That'll get you maybe like, 90% of what he does for a huge saving. So he, you can play him. Like, I, I won't say that you can't because he's not in a void, but he's not somebody that I will probably target. I'm old enough to remember when Sam Hartman was like in the sixes probably and won a G. I didn't win it because I didn't play him, but I stacked Wake Forest UNC last year. Mm -hmm. Sam Hartman, Sam Howell uh, stack won the whole thing. Uh, and I had almost everything except I did not have Hartman. One thing with Hartman is that he has given us a lot on the ground this year. He scored a lot of rushing touchdowns. And so, you know, I'm not sure he's mobile, but he that's not like – I'm not sure you can count on that. And so that would make me a little worried that he could pay off a 10K salary if he has a game where he's not getting in the end zone on the ground specifically. 
Then we've got Sam Howell. He belongs up here. I mean, 9,800 against Wake Forest. I have no problem there. Both of these guys are routinely into the 30s every single week. Uh, Matt Corral versus Liberty. He's, uh, you could call him discounted at 9,600. His health, I think, is a little concerning, but he's been, he, he, was, he started last game, then he didn't he come out a little bit against Auburn, but then come back in. He finished uh, with 37 attempts, so he played most of the game, but he's been, he's, it's been weird. Yeah, for, I, for I'm not sure he's healthy. Yeah, Still, I kind of think he's like trying I, to play through something. Yeah, he, I mean, Matt Carell, NFL prospect, needs to learn how to not take hits because he takes a hit, big hit almost every time that he rushes. So he really needs to learn how to do that. I mean, if I knew that he was healthy, I'd feel much better about it. I actually think Liberty has a chance in this game. And I and, and Liberty is actually incredibly slow paced. They're a bottom 20 team in terms of pace. So I actually think this game has a chance to go under. Um, now that it's like a play for me, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was a little bit lower scoring than we think it's going to be. So I, I don't like Corral at 9,600. I think that's a little too expensive for him. Well, yeah, and I think the not being 100% could potentially get knocked out at any point. Um, and like you said, yeah, Liberty shockingly only allows 57 plays per game um, on defense. They're actually ranked pretty high in terms of pass defense. But again, they're playing an independent G5 schedule for the most part. So I think we can take that with a grain of salt. But I don't love Corral either um at that price point so those are the big guys who can you can pretty much count on well then malik willis on the other side of that same coin uh another guy who routinely scores into the 30s against ole miss we kind of gotta like this as the fourth most expensive qb if you want to get up in the to the nines I think you're you're He's like fine. Uh, I think this week, much. like, one second. Chris is experiencing some technical difficulties, but you know when he comes back, we'll touch on Malik Willis and Tanner Mordecai. So there's actually five QBs this week averaging over thirty points a game, um, all at nine K or above. So one thing you should ask yourself is why not take the cheapest guy who still has 30 point upside in Mordecai for nine K against a Memphis defense. It's not like he's facing some good defense. I mean, Memphis might be the worst defense of all of these teams. Um, you know, Mordecai feels like the play at nine K you're saving all this money and you're still getting the tremendous upside of, you know, He's going to throw for 300 yards, three to four touchdowns. Uh, just, you know, he's just killing it this year in that SMU offense. I actually like the other. So let's assume that Seth Hennigan plays. Like, he oh, hasn't yeah. played the Can last we assume two weeks. I'm sorry. Can we assume that? Because I was curious myself if you had any inside info. It, so it sounds like he's a game time decision. So I'm going to go with the assumption that he is playing for the purpose of this. That happened last time too, though. And then we had Peter Parrish and I had to yeah. sit there and watch Peter Parrish play quarterback, which was like a very unenjoyable experience. So let's, let's pretend, let's pretend in our fantasy world that he's playing. Okay. 8,200 Seth Hennigan is one of my favorite plays in the slate because SMU's oh, yeah. pass defense is awful like really yeah really terrible. no i'm totally with you on that so if he plays if he plays because that and it's a still a big stretch i love heading in this week i think that he is going to have a big game if he's healthy yeah, no, I, I'm I'm definitely with you. If Hennigan's ready to go, I'm I'm all about it for 8,200. That's fantastic. Uh, you can even stack that game. It gets tricky though with the pricing, as we'll talk about. Um, so then, any value quarterbacks for you? Uh, these were obviously the big names, and then we touched on Hennigan. Um, 
you know, there's not a lot. I mean, Ritter, we we just pretty much are against Ritter in general. CJ Stroud has, you know, four touchdown upside any given week, coming off a bit of a dud against Penn State. Otherwise, though, threw for five, five, and four touchdowns against Rutgers, Maryland, Indiana. Uh, against Nebraska, I'm not really scared about Nebraska, but I think, I don't know, 8,600, I was hoping he'd be cheaper off the dud. Yeah, he's somewhat he, discounted, though. He's fine. Like, he, my thing with him is that, like, he's not an avoid, but he's not a target either. So, like, you may end up with some lineups with him. Um, I do have two value quarterbacks I, I like, though. Adrian Martinez. Got to. Heisman Martinez. Uh, Ohio State. So, I actually talked about them being better against the pass. Um, but... That's not true. I mean, they, they're letting get receivers get wide open in that secondary still, and we're just having bad quarterback play where wide receivers like aren't getting passes because the quarterbacks are terrible. Mm-hmm. But I think Martinez could hit some of those. So I Martinez is at seven K, and I, I, he has the rushing upside to pay off for sure this week. So I don't, I really don't mind that. And then the other value guy I like actually is Aiden O'Connell, the quarterback oh, for Purdue. Really. Um, He's interesting this week because we just saw Michigan State's defense get lit up by Michigan. And I never thought Michigan State's defense was much to write home about in the first place. I feel like they've generated a lot off of luck. And so so I've never really been particularly scared of them. I think Aiden O'Connell at 5,600 is a really interesting option this week. And there, there are stacking options that could look pretty nice with him as well. I know I was doing O'Connell ver- and David Bell last week. That's very interesting. You're right. Michigan State's defense, you know, one thing is they allow a ton of plays, uh, 83 plays per game, which is absolutely insane. Uh, and so you love picking anyone on the uh, opposing offense that just gets to run a ton of plays. Uh, but they are pretty good at like limiting explosive plays and things like that. Um, but, but, you know, Michigan had explosive plays somehow. I, I don't know what happened there. That was bizarre. Um, but yeah, I, I could get down with that. Man, that's super savings. I hadn't really thought that cheap. I'm totally with you on Adrian Martinez. I mean, you cannot, if you actually just sort, and I I mean, I don't normally do this. I just did it for fun. If you sort QBs by points per game, the, like the top, the first page is all like 8,000 and above. And then there's Adrian Martinez sitting at 7K. Obviously, he can give you 10 points, uh, you know, like last week or whatever. He had four picks or something like that. But uh, at 7K, I mean, just he has 30 point upside with 7K. I mean, that's just a very good value in a game. They're going to have to put the pedal to the metal, I think. All right. That sums up quarterbacks pretty well, I think. Um then we have running back and, uh, you know, I don't, I think the elephant in the room is what are we doing with the Georgia backs here against Missouri? Uh, you know, they're not even that expensive. They do split a lot of time, but Zamir white sitting at 7,100. And I think I may be partial to James cook at 5,900. What do you, what do you think in here? Muted. James Cook is more of the receiving back. Um, so it it worries me a little bit. Because they, they definitely will not need to throw at all. Yeah, I mean, that's more of his role. But I'm pretty sure that I will end up playing a little bit at minimum of Zamir White. This, this, this Missouri defense just allowed like 200 plus yards to Vanderbilt on the ground. They've allowed 300 plus yards to southeastern missouri i think i got the direction right mm-hmm. i mean at some point like you just have to play pretty much everyone um I, I, you could absolutely play james cook i don't think james cook is out of the question i know he's more involved in receiving game but he did have 10 carries last week so it's not really like he isn't involved it's just like is he going to be as it, like what's his role this week um the one option and i think this is like a like a real true bargain bin option is Kenny McIntosh. Mm. Um, I think he's the third guy up there. And if we think that Missouri's just hemorrhaging yards on the ground, then McIntosh is a guy that 
at least is interesting. Yeah. And I mean, is Kendall Milton healthy? Do we know? It looks like probably not. It said Milton I don't will make so. multiple weeks due to a knee injury. So we're probably not in a place where they're going to rush him back. Certainly not against Missouri. So I think Milton's out, which I agree with you. That does mean uh, Kenny McIntosh is the third man in. And, you know, in the second half, he could get 12 to 15 carries and get a touchdown. And, you know, I think 75 and a touch is way within play. I mean, he he gets run anyway. Uh, you know, he had he had uh, one for four and three. Well, he only had three for seven against Florida, but against Arkansas, 10 for 57 and then one catch for 27 yards. And I think there's a decent chance he gets in the end zone here. So, you know, you could be looking at a 10 point day, maybe 15 which would be a lot, but Missouri, you cannot overstate how atrocious. I mean, I don't know if it's talent or scheme. It's got to be at some point. It's got to be scheme. Like there's no way they're they're They have such little talent that it, they must just like not the coach philosophy must just be like, I don't care about giving up the run or something. Yeah. I, they play a weird, uh, not that's weird, but like the, their defense is, is, a little bit unconventional like they lead the country in in uh man coverage like each year so like they play a little bit funky almost every time so i'm not super surprised that they're like well and they're, they're obviously points not very I, good I think that we're gonna see a change in defense coordinator very soon <laughs> Yeah, well, they're pot committed at this point. So, yeah, Kenny McIntosh offers a tremendous amount of savings, but you have to realize your upside is a little limited. I mean, I, I don't think you're going to get more than 15 points. So I don't think you're going to get 4X, 5X from Kenny McIntosh. Um, although it's they just have such – they just don't run plays at George. I mean, it's like you look and you're like, well, somebody's got to be getting 20 carries. Nobody's getting 20 carries. I mean, it's just – it's really weird. I guess they're 118th in the country in plays run per game. They only run 62 plays per game. That's not very many. Um, so it's just kind of a gross offense for fantasy, but I think Kenny McIntosh makes sense. Uh, all right. So that's the UGA. Had to touch on that. Give it its proper due. Um, you got Kenneth Walker coming off <laughs> a five touchdown game against Michigan he's done it he has two games this year I believe well no he had a he has a four touchdown game and a five touchdown game I don't know if I'm going to play him though again what do you think against Purdue that we probably like the passing games in this in this game if, if anything Uh, he's probably just because how good he's been. So, oh yeah, I, mean, I will play him a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah, I mean, why not take Jerome Ford for eighty three hundred? I mean, they probably both have three touchdown upside potentially. So, it just seems like it's yeah. a tough premium to pay on this slate. Trevion Henderson, I'm never going to tell you not to play Trevion Henderson seventy nine hundred. I mean, kid's amazing. He had twenty eight attempts versus Penn State. Uh, I think he's just their guy i mean i don't think they're trying to get anybody else the ball really he's not sharing time anymore he's he's an absolute monster so i like that he's going to catch one or two passes it's a bit of a discount 7900 i mean you're not paying a premium there kyron williams against navy is interesting he catches passes which you love to see i mean he's going to go three four catches which is nice uh he's been getting 20 carries recently he had 199 yards against unc Against a Navy team, the only downside is Navy, you know, not a lot of players are going to be running this game because Navy sits on it. They run the option, yada, yada, yada. We've talked about that before. Um, I don't love playing teams against service academies, but Navy's – I'm not scared of the Navy defense for 7,700. Are you interested in Kyron? He's fine. Like, <laughs> I think this is the week to, like, pay up a little bit at running back. Yeah, um, Jerome or or uh, 
or Trevion, or I guess you did like Walker a little bit. Yeah, I, yeah, I like Trevion a lot. Um, Abram, I, I really like Abram Smith. Um, right. He's seventy three hundred, so it's not like you're like paying up, paying up for him. But he was huge last week, and TCU's rush defense is terrible. Yeah. So it's not like necessarily like a huge pay up, but it, it it is a guy that's above seven seven K that I really really like again this week. I think that he could have a, a monster um, game again. I mean, he's just been he's so incredibly involved in, in the rushing game. He's averaging over eleven hundred or eleven hundred. I wish he was averaging over eleven hundred. He's averaging um, a hundred eleven rushing yards per game. Yeah. Um, and he's like, he's a senior there. So they're, they're really defaulting to him. So he, he's been incredibly impressive, but I think that's a great call. Actually, that's a really great call. And, you know, he catches some passes. He's going to, he's got two games, uh, back to back with two. So that's nice. And he's coming off to back to back 20 plus carry games as well. Uh, I think you're right. He has pretty much evolved into their feature back. And yeah, we love taking backs against TCU. There's no question about it. Yeah, he was a guy I really liked last week as well, and he paid off. So I'm I'm going back to the well here. I agree. I think that's great. I think Tyler Batty. We don't need to talk too much. I don't care if he catches passes. He may catch ten passes, but you just can't against no. Georgia. Uh, Zamir Light. We talked about. Isaiah Spiller versus Auburn. I don't – I just haven't found a lot of success or, or, or good value playing Texas A&M running backs. I mean, they split time. You know, they're, you know, they're all – they're going to get a 15 to 18 carries for one guy, 10 to 12 for the other guy. At 7K, is that enough for you to like Spiller here? Not really. Um, like, I – I don't know. Like, I don't really want to play him. And I don't love that game. I mean, I just don't think there's yeah. a good chance the game goes crazy. He Let hasn't, had, he hasn't really had a uh, week when, like, a no. breaking week either. Like, he just produces, but, like, you're not sitting with him and being like, oh, I, I you know, I can win a I, – I can take down a GPP. Like, that's not really the player he is. He's a – He's a high floor player. Maybe he'll get you like 18 to 22 points, but you're not getting like a 40 point week out of him, especially not this week. Yeah. And I think, you know, we always talk about how we, we generally lean towards GPP discussions on this podcast, but I think at seven K he very well could be a pretty safe cash play uh, where he's going to give you, you know, 80 to 100 yards, almost lock and load that. Probably one touchdown, probably two receptions. So at 7K, I think you're going to get 3X out of him. And maybe that's what you want in a cash game. So I think he's very safe at not too much of a premium. Letty Brown, I don't want to play him against Oklahoma State. The, the defense is just really good. I like Letty Brown, but not against in that matchup to me. Um. Take me through some of these guys in the sixes, Chris. Um, we're avoiding Spiller. We're, I think we're avoiding A-Chain as well for kind of the same reasons. They just cannibalize each other so much where it's really hard to get to either of them, especially if they're priced up. And on this slate, they are. Um, I'm interested in Marquise Irving this week at 6,300 for Minnesota. It, they they are I don't know what's going on with with the Gophers, but I mean they're just dropping running backs like flies. Like I have no idea what's going on. Hey, Marquis Servin might be the last guy standing there. Uh, he's splitting a little bit of time with Kai Thomas, but I, Irving's really kind of earned the role. So I, I I'm really interested to see what he does this week. And uh, he's only sixty three hundred, which which definitely makes me interested. Um, a guy I like this a little bit more expensive than him is Ty Chandler. Ty Chandler has actually been really solid the last few weeks. He started off slow, but we're getting a 76 point total, which means that I, I don't think that like we just saw Wake Forest get beat up on the ground by a triple option army team. Like, do we really think they can stop the run that effectively? Probably not. And, and, and so Ty Chandler is a guy in the six K that I think has a good shot to pay off. Um, you know, I, I'll talk about it 
around for a second because I do think he's worth talking about. He was good last week in a tough matchup against Iowa State, but he's not a guy that I want to play even at 6,900. I love his workload. I think that he's heavily involved each week. He's getting 18 to 20 rushes and, you know, five targets. But he's a guy that I think is, I think, fairly good. Um, that's not really the mid But, you know, th- th- there there are options in, in the sub 5K range. A guy like Henry Parrish is going against a Liberty defense that hasn't been super solid against the rush. You know, you know, Parrish is 4,900 and Liberty ranks 56 in defensive EPA per rush attempt and 58th in uh, explosive uh, rush rate. So there are some guys in the sub 5K range that, you know, we can, we, we can do something with, but I, overall, this is not a, not a slate where I think you need to pay down at running back. You can find value elsewhere, especially at quarterback. I think this week. That's a great take on the running backs. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think um, it's tough to find a lot of value. The one guy, I don't know if you mentioned, I did have to step away for a minute, but uh, Kai Thomas also for Minnesota. I mean, it seems like they're given basically two guys, 20 carries um, over the last few weeks. Uh, and those are the last two men standing. So I think either one could be in play. Do you think that Marquise Irving is that much better of a play than, than Kai? Uh, I think you're you cut out a minute. Um, there you are. I think so. I'm, Thomas is five. A Irving is sixty-three. Um, Illinois defense isn't the worst, so I mean, I think I'd rather take the guy that I think has the higher chance to get like twenty touches. I think that's Irving. Um, yeah, I just was surprised to see that that Kai Thomas had uh, he has had twenty carries in the last two games uh, t- each. Twenty one and twenty one, he's back to back hundred yard games. I mean, they're just feeding both guys uh, right now, so I don't know. Thought is worth uh, considering. So let's see here. Uh, yeah, I think there's nobody else too, too cheap that I'm that interested in other than we already talked about Kenny McIntosh at the bottom of the barrel. So receivers, and this is where it's going to get, I think a little tricky because you've got two guys, three guys. I mean, I want to roster three $8,000 receivers and that just doesn't really work. How do you choose? I mean, Josh Downs is almost like, I don't see, it feels like you have to play Josh Downs, but maybe you take the slight discount and go with Calvin Austin, who also is a total stud and going to catch eight plus balls as well. But I think you can't fade both of them. Can you? Yeah, I I prefer Downs. Um, He's monopolizing the target share. I mean, just absolutely insane. Yeah, he has 27 targets over his last three games. Um, and Ja'Kari Roberson has been fantastic, right? Like, just so, so good. Is he the guy that you go to? He only has 17 targets over his last uh, three games. Calvin Austin, 8,400, 13 targets. Like, it's the Josh Down show. And I think if you're going to pay up for an 8,000 receiver, I think he's the guy you want to do it with. And – Are you of the mindset that you like have to play Josh Downs? I mean, I I don't see how you don't like if he's on a slate, you kind of play him. I mean, across the entire college football landscape, I feel like he's the most voluminous wide receiver. 40% target share. Like that's that's insane. Yeah. He's the only one doing anything. Um, Do you have to play him? I mean, Within no, reason, but... like obviously, you you can always make some crazy case for not playing somebody, but I feel like it's yeah, you pretty like I will play a lot of him. 
Like he should be over nine thousand. I mean, eighty seven hundred is a lot, but like he should be more. Pro- he should be where we had Elijah Moore last year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he absolutely should be. So I think even at that price tag, he's just somewhat of a value, which is wild. Yeah. No, um, I, I tend to agree. And then, okay, Calvin Austin, I think you could play him. You don't have to. But if you're going to go Hen again, it's going to be tough to not also stack with Austin, I feel like, if you think Hennigan's going to go off. I think you could stack with, like, secondary options. Dykes? Um, Dykes like is way down there. I like Javon Ivory. Um, yeah, what is the deal with Ivory? I actually didn't know much about him at all um, before a couple weeks ago. Is he, like, emerging? Has he always kind of been there? Only seven targets the last three games, though. I think he's a second-year player. Okay. Yeah, I mean they also, haven't thrown a lot because the last three games with, so it's with hard a grain to, like, of really salt. Gauge. Sorry, go ahead. I talked over you. Yeah. No, I I was basically saying the same thing, right? Like, it's hard to evaluate without Hennigan. So I I think Ivory is actually discounted here. I, he's the guy that I I think I want to play. Austin is just really expensive. I can get a four thousand. Uh, discount off of Austin for a guy that I think could get like one or two less targets. Like that's a huge win. Uh, so I think Ivory's the guy that I want. I think Ivory's the guy that I want to target there. I mean, you could make a case for Gabriel Rogers, who has five in his last three, but like I, I, I know Ivory is the secondary wire option there. So he's the guy that I want. Okay, I think that's a good that's a good call on Ivory at forty four hundred. That's a steep, steep, steep discount. I don't mind that at all. You kind of need it. You're gonna need to find, especially if you're paying up for running back. Um, so I like that. Um, you know, the last game I watched that whole game. I was in Vegas. I had pay, I bet on Memphis because I didn't know that uh, that uh, Hennigan was out until right before kickoff. I watched the game. Peter Parrish totally just awful as a passer and so anything in the last few games i don't think we can really evaluate uh so 4400 that's real nice actually that's a real nice number for a guy who could be in a big high scoring game um you know david bell we've kind of touched on him against mississippi or michigan state i think you can stack him with o'connell uh, Garrett Wilson is finally more expensive than Chris Olave and all is right with the world. But at 7,100 against Nebraska, are you interested? We've been playing him all year. But he's been in the sixes a lot. He's just over seven now. Yeah, he's finally appropriately priced for once. Finally over Olave. I, the, the Ohio State wide receiver that I'm actually targeting in this matchup is... Jackson Smith and Jigba. Um, JSN, he's coming on. Yeah, he is running the same amount of routes as everybody else, and he's actually out targeting Chris Olave um, over like over the last three weeks, but really over the last four or five, um, he's really taken on a bigger role, and he's really impressed as a sophomore. So he's the guy that I want at fifty eight hundred. You're getting a twenty one hundred dollar discount on a guy that I think has kind of assumed the wide receiver two position over Olave. So <sighs> boy, that's I think gonna he's the guy I want here. People angry. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, a lot of it is such a safe, like, option, right? But JSN it has been really, really assuming a bigger role in this offense. So you're oh, getting yeah. a huge discount with him. Yeah, he's run the same amount of routes. He has one more target than Olave over the last three games. I mean, he's really, really come on. I mean, six, six, and five catches almost basically – Three straight weeks over 100 yards. He went 103, 99, 97. He went 93, but that was against Akron. Uh, but then these are like, this is Big Ten play, and he is really coming on. Very exciting in the Devi space as well. I think at this point, you know, basically overshadowing who some people thought was a first round pick, Chris Olave, as a true sophomore. Um, highly, highly impressive stuff from Jackson Smith and Jigba. Um, let's talk about Mississippi because I think I've been playing three weeks in a row, Jacor Pearson, and he won me a little bit of money last week. He's priced up a little bit, but he's really coming on. He's like, he's basically their wide receiver two now behind Drummond. 
I think he's a good value still, even at 4,900. But I, I did like him more when he was in the threes. That's for sure. Yeah. So I don't know if Mingo is playing this week, which is going to be a huge impact. He is a pretty bad injury. So, but I've seen rumors that he might play. So yeah. there's a lot to like understand about what this matchup looks like. Because if he's not playing, then I like Pearson a lot more because he's running the most routes on the team over the last few games. So like he's definitely a guy that I, I really, really like. Um, well, apparently I mean, Drummond Drum- is questionable as well. Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah. Th- so there's, there's opportunity in this, um, in this receiver core. I think Drummond is also underpriced 6,500. Um, I think that's too low, just too low for him. Um, you know, their team total is basically 40. So, I just think you're getting a pretty good value there. He's been really solid all year. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely a lot of value there. What about Liberty pass catchers? I mean, I think everybody could be in play against Ole Miss's defense. Uh, they have a $6,000 receiver in Douglas. CJ Daniels, I think, is kind of their tight end. Uh, is Yeah, he's their tight end, basically. He's 5300 not a super cheap uh situation there um do you like anybody i mean i just i don't really know it's malik willis or bust maybe uh because he runs so much yeah i'm probably not playing a wide receiver in this game um i mean i just think the ceiling's fairly low i've not been impressed by liberty this year like yeah i don't think that they played terribly well so yeah i'm and willis probably avoiding is- their pass catchers yeah, Willis is putting up his points, but that's kind of that's kind of it. Um, yeah. And then, you know, we got to talk about the Mustangs. We got to talk about SMU. Danny Gray. They have three guys who are really good. Get a lot of looks. Danny Gray, uh, Robert Roberson, and Rasheed Rice. Rice being the cheapest of the trio. I mean, I I really like him. I know that's not uh, you know amazing analysis. Take the cheapest guy, but. He's also seen second most targets. Uh, he's running. He's actually not running that many route routes, but seeing a lot of targets. And I think it's him or Calcaterra if you want to get in on SMU. Yeah, I think you can actually stack a couple guys in this game. Like if you want to play Rice, go for it. If you want to play Calcaterra, go for it. I mean, Calcaterra um, at only four K is pretty nice considering. Yeah, you know, he's, he's so less priced than Danny Gray. He's run second most routes on the team in the last three games. Shout out to your sheet. He's got five unrealized fantasy points per game. So I think he at 4K, Calcaterra is very nice. Yeah, you just hope he gets some more touchdown luck like he had earlier in the year. That's really what you're hoping for. Um, yeah. I think my favorite play there is pretty probably Rishi Rice, but yeah, I like Rice. I too. also like Calcaterra a lot, so I'm not going to disagree with you. Uh, I like Calcaterra a lot. Um, that's most of the interesting guys, I think, just looking at the games. You know, I don't think we're playing a whole lot from the passing game of Baylor, TCU, Auburn, Texas A&M. I mean, none of these games, like I can't even think of receivers I'm interested in. Now, we did mention Penn State having the, you know, a 30-point total is kind of interesting because they can't really run the ball. Uh, They're going after the pass. If they're going to get to 30 points, you know, I'm not sure I want to pay up for Dotson at 7,600, but Parker Washington at 55 is kind of interesting. Where are you at on Penn State? If Let's assume they're going to score 30 points. I don't know if they're going to get to 30, to be honest. I think that that's a pretty aggressive like, prediction. So I don't They have love... a pretty good explosive pass rate, actually. Mostly yeah. due to Dotson, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I actually think Sean Clifford and a Dotson stack isn't crazy because Sean Clifford's price so low at 6K where you could actually afford to wow, get Dotson. Wow, he's 6K? Yeah, so, I didn't so I think that's actually like an think... interesting play that we didn't touch on earlier. Like, if you want to play Clifford and Dawson, I think you can. I, I have the like under in this game, though. So, like, just, just saying. Is saying what? 
I have that. I have the under fifty. Oh yeah, there. yeah, the under. Well, that makes sense. I mean, sure, but the under could be because Maryland doesn't score anything, and they could still get to thirty. I don't know. It's interesting. I think there's some sneaky offense on the Penn State side. I would have never thought they'd have a team total of thirty. which is kind of that, you know, marker for me to be interested in an offense if you're going to get to 30. Um, oh, yeah. But, man, 6K? 6K for the quarterback of a team with the ninth highest total on the slate that can't run the ball. That's – those are some check boxes. Yeah, I actually might take the Penn State team total over – um they can't run the ball dude they cannot run the ball look at this they're ranked outside the top 110 in all rushing metrics if they're going to get to 30 it's going to be on clifford i agree actually than clifford in that entire passing game is underpriced wow i think i just had like a eureka (laughs) i don't think i realized he was six freaking k and he can give you 30 yards on the ground yeah. You know, he can chip in. Uh, wow. That's really interesting. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, you know, you just saw it live. Like, we just figured out the skeleton key, I think, for the Week 10 slate. Uh, anybody else in the wide receiver room? Any cheap guys? I don't think there's a ton of, like, cheap value this week, which makes it difficult. I'll give you one more, and it's probably the only guy I'll add. Uh, Samori Torre at Nebraska, um, you know, Ohio state was letting Penn state receivers run open, but Clifford couldn't hit them. He's 4,400. He's definitely the wide receiver one there. 12 targets over his last three games. I just think he's the, he's the guy. Um, you could do a lot worse at that price point. So he's really the guy that I like under 45, probably more than anybody else. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that just about does it. We went through quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers. Uh, This is our first evaluation of the slate. We've done some research. Chris does his worksheet for for the show every single week. Uh, He will also have a write-up that will be for members only coming out tomorrow. Um, But things change. We think about different things. We're always chatting about it, you know, amongst each other. And um, we – we could have some new thoughts. So tune in on Saturday morning. We have a live show that we will talk about any new changes, updates, new injuries um, for this slate. We will also talk about bets that we like Um, shout out, tune in to the three and out where we have a contest going. I am 16 and three, no six, 15 and three in my top two picks for the season. That's a pretty good winning percentage, Um, but tune in for that on Friday mornings and then Saturday morning, our live show. We'll also talk about bets. We'll also talk about prize picks. And if you want to get in on prize picks, if you don't know about it, it is a um, basically a props app where you can choose to go over or under a certain total and win real cash. If you sign up for the first time, promo code C2C, get in there. It's a lot of fun. We And we will walk you through our favorite props on Saturday morning as well. So tune in for those shows coming up. Thank you once again for joining us with Whiteway till Sunday. Let's bink a few tourneys. Chris, have a great week. Go Gamecocks. <laughs>